All right, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to break into IT as a career field. And in today's topic, it's going to discuss the help desk more specifically, or as a lot of people fondly called who've worked in IT, the hell desk. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff covered in this video. It's probably gonna be a fairly long one. I'll drop timestamps on the video if you wanna skip around. I would recommend just watching the whole thing, especially if you're new to IT and you want to start learning this stuff, or let's say you already know something in particular that I'm already talking about. You know, Maybe you just wanna to skip to a different section, but I would recommend just sticking around for the entire thing. And uh, for the, the OGs of this channel, I decided to break out the old hat today. It's been a while since I've wore it, so let's get started. All right, first thing. This is something that's really important to consider. I see this come up a lot. I, I still pay attention quite a bit to uh, stuff that comes up on people that ask about how to get into IT is they'll, they, they get this idea in their head that, hey, I just wanna jump into IT. I don't know anything about it, but I've heard that it pays well and employers are hiring people for IT constantly and, and so on and so forth. And, well, I just need to get into the help desk and I can move up from there. But I look at it as you're putting the cart before the horse. And what I mean by that is I think you really need to take some time to consider what it is that you're going to want to get out of this and move on to later on down the road. Because the help desk is a way to get in. It is not, it, at least it shouldn't be your end destination. I've heard about people that end up spending like 10 years in the help desk or the, the hell desk, again, as I like to call it, and a lot of other IT people like to call it. I've seen people spend like 10 plus years doing this. I hear about it constantly of people in these organizations that basically spend an entire career there. You know, if that's something you want to do and you enjoy it, whatever. I'm not knocking it if that's what you want to do. But if you want to move up and get out of there, you're going to have to kind of have a track in mind and you're going to have to come up with a game plan to figure out what you're going to do. And so let's talk about that. So as far as the track that I'm talking about, give this a little bit of forethought. You know, like <clears throat> when you want to move out of help desk, what is it that you want to go to? Do you want to be a sysadmin? Do you want to go into DevOps? Do you want to be a network engineer? Do you want to be a cybersecurity analyst? You know, there's, there's a ton of different things in the IT field. All of these have their own specialties. You know, it's, that's why it's important to think ahead of time. Think about what's, what's going to be your move after you get into help desk. What are you going to be working towards next? Maybe this isn't the greatest analogy, but I look at it like this because I hear about people that just jump into help desk and then they they haven't given it any further thought after that. Again, maybe this isn't the best analogy, but I look at it like, you know, let's say you wanted to be a doctor. Let's say that being a, a, a general physician or general practitioner, whatever they're called, is we'll use that as the help desk. And so uh, you know, the person's going through uh, medical school, they're spending all this time there but they haven't given any thought to what they want to do past that. It's like, okay, well, do you want to be like a, an, do you want to be an ER doctor? Do you want to be a brain surgeon? What do you want to do? Or are you just going to get into this general thing and stay there forever again, if that's what you want to do and, and that's what you're content doing, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But again, plan this out a little bit and think about what it is that you want, because what you're going to do for your training, uh, what you're going to do for courses that you need to take, certs, whatever. That's stuff should line up with where it is that you're trying to go. Okay, so let's say that you've got something kind of picked out. Let's say you start out, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to start out the help desk and I want to end up as, let's say, DevOps. Okay, you want to move. Well, that'd be a hell of a move if you went from help desk to DevOps, but it's, it's something you could do if you put in the work. So next thing you've got to obviously start out at the help desk. And so now we're going to kind of start covering how to break into the shit hot market. Now, when I say shit hot, I'm, I'm saying this from a couple different avenues. If you took a look at, especially what happened over the last few years with uh, remote work, companies struggling to find people to come in and work 
and do fill critical IT roles. You know, they couldn't keep people around and, and there's a lot of factors that go into that. I can't break down all that on this video, but these employers were struggling to get people in, okay? So from that aspect, it's shit hot because, hey, we need people in here to the point that we're so desperate that we're willing to hire people with absolutely zero IT experience, train them up, pay them a decent wage, and then these people can move up to making a ton more money, you know, picking some sort of specialty. I'm also talking when I say shit hot, you've also got to consider the aspect, especially, you know, we're, we're over halfway through 2023 now, a lot of people in the IT industry are starting to lose their jobs. And granted, I mean, a lot of them are clowns, a lot of them really sucked at what they did, but there's also a lot of good people that have lost their job and they've been getting laid off. And you know, we've got IT or AI on the way, which that's a, a mess all in and of itself. But it's also shit hot from that aspect because you know, you've got probably millions of people at this point that are somewhat actively looking for employment in the IT industry. And so you're gonna have to figure out a way to separate yourself, uh, figuratively speaking, separating the wheat from the chaff. You know, are, are you just going to be the chaff or are you going to be the person that just barely knows enough to uh, work the help desk and, and make it through basic help tickets? Or are you the person that's going to go above and beyond on your own time to, you know, oh, I want to become a sysadmin, which means you're going to have to put in quite a bit of work in your free time to learn this stuff. IT is incredibly in-depth, complicated. I've... <sighs> For the people that haven't had any exposure to the IT industry, this is the kind of thing you could do full time, let's say 50 hours a week for the next 40 years. You wouldn't even scratch the surface. The, I love this field because it's, it's so mentally stimulating. There's so much to learn, but also so much of what you learn changes within, let's say a year or two. So you've always got to be on top of things. And if you really want to be able to stand out in this field, if you want to be able to get attention, if you want to be good at what you do, you're going to have to put in the extra work and go the extra mile. You know, that applies to a lot of other things that are out there in the world. You know, I've spent plenty of time as a construction worker, and it's the same thing in the construction industry. You've got to spend plenty of time going out and doing framing or hanging steel or drywalling or whatever it is that you want to specialize in. There's plenty of work that goes into learning it, but then also getting better at it and going down the path of, of mastery. So we're gonna talk about how to break into this market. I can tell you right now, like I said, halfway through, through 2023 with AI on the way, the, the jobs market the way it is, there's still a lot of opportunity out there. There's still a lot of people that they don't put in the work. And so it's, I mean, it's really not hard to surpass a lot of people, but you're going to have to you're gonna to have to do the work. If a person were to get into the trades industry right now, for example, I don't think they're going to have to put in as much work learning this stuff as they would have to put in to learning IT because tra the trades industry, for example, is really hurting for people. It's a supply and demand thing. You've gotta keep that in mind. This is part of the jobs market. Supply and demand is in full effect here. Next thing, let's talk about how you're going to move up, what are, what's the best way and uh, the trap to keep in mind here. So how to move up? Well, we'll get into that here in just a minute because I'm actually gonna cover that more in depth. Uh, as far as the best way, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Don't get caught up on just one method. When you get in, let's say you have no IT experience. That's what this video is really. If you have some IT experience, this video is, is fine. There's still gonna be plenty of stuff that's applicable to you if you're trying to move up in the IT industry but I'm making this video more so for the beginners. Now a trap, so I mentioned the trap that I've talked about here. That is letting yourself get um, basically pigeonholed into the help desk. And what I mean by that is, and this applies to probably a lot of other jobs out there, but let's say you come into the IT industry and you've you've worked in the help desk for four years. Now, maybe there's instances where what you're trying to jump to next really just requires a ton of work. Maybe you've had a lot of stuff in life going on. 
Maybe you've really struggled to get the work done that you need to to be able to move up to the next thing. Maybe the, the local jobs market where you're at hasn't been all that great. But the issue is the longer you spend in the help desk, generally speaking, this doesn't apply, I'm speaking here as a generality. Generally speaking, the more time you spend in the help desk, the harder it's going to be to get out of there. What I mean by that is, Put you, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the employer because the help desk is meant to be, for most people, an entry-level job. And again, don't take this as me shit-talking you if you want to spend 10, 20 years working the help desk. I have no problem with that. That's great. I'm not slamming people that spend years working in the help desk. You know, if you just want a regular 8 to 5 and you want to have all the free time to yourself and you don't want to have to go home and put in tons of time learning, uh, new stuff in the IT industry, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to move out of that and progress into a different field in IT, again, the longer you spend there, the harder it's going to be to get out. So put yourself in the shoes of an employer because a lot of people, when they go in a help desk, they want to move up to something else. So let's put yourself in the shoes of an employer, okay? An employer's looking, you send your resume to an employer. You've got four years on the help desk, and let's say you want to move to a system administrator role. And the potential employers looking at your application, they're like, wow, so he spent four years on the help desk and he's got, let's say you picked up a, the A plus and the network plus comp T asserts while you were there. A lot of employers are going to look at that, just being blunt with you guys, a lot of employers are going to look at that and say, Wow, he's been on help desk for four years and he's picked up one or two crappy certs. This isn't really a guy that we want because it doesn't seem like he shows any initiative. This is what I'm saying when, this is what I mean when I say, the longer that you spend here, the harder it's gonna be. Now, don't think that you can just, if you have no IT experience, don't think you can just spend like two or three months at the help desk and then jump into being a system administrator. Could that happen and has it happened? Yes, but, Typically, like that year or two, a year, one to two years is a lot of time. If you're using it properly, that's a lot of time to learn a lot of the IT skills that you're going to need to move up to one of these other, uh, these, one of these tracks, one of these specialties that, you know, you want to get into. The other thing I'm going to mention here, so now I'm going to throw a bit of a wrench into everything that I've said. Let's say you have a ton of IT experience, but you've never actually been paid to work in IT. There's plenty of people out there that are like this, and you know, don't undersell yourself. There's plenty of people that undersell themselves, they undercut themselves, they don't give themselves enough credit. Now, if you're going to jump into something like a system administrator role right away, then yeah, you better have your shit together and you better know what you're doing. But there are plenty of people out there that could jump straight into a system administrator role without ever having to work in the help desk. And the, one of the problems that I see is if you go to one of these job forums or Reddit or whatever, is I'll see people go in there and ask questions. You know, I've done all this stuff for IT. Do I have to work in the help desk? And I've seen users go and reply and say, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of, of doing anything in IT unless you work in the help desk for like, let's say at least a year. I see all of this asinine bullshit. And if you were to jump straight into one of these roles straight away without having any help desk experience, you're probably going to be the exception, not the rule. Again, you're gonna to have to have a pretty considerable amount of IT experience. But if you know how to do all of this stuff and you could do a system administrator's job, don't undersell yourself and think that you have to go to hell desk and spend a year or two working there. Go ahead and apply to whatever job that whatever specialty that you have those skills for because you never know, maybe you can just maybe you can just move straight on in, no problem. There's been plenty of people that have done that and don't let someone else gatekeep you. I see this a lot on things like Reddit threads is people will go in there and gatekeep and say, oh, it's, it's this mentality of, oh, well, I had to struggle and what I did sucked and therefore everyone else should have to struggle and go through the same suck that I did, you know, work in help desk for two years. I, it's, it wouldn't be fair for someone else to be able to just jump straight into a system administrator role. Again, if you can do that, by all means, go for it. If you can skip the help desk, more, pa shit, more power to you. I don't, again, don't undercut yourself. So, 
let's move off of that. So now we're going to talk more about how to move up, which is what we're going to get into in these next sections here. Next thing, companies want people who are well-rounded. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is super important in today's world. You can go, I'm not going to pull up a bunch of articles, but you can go do some Googling on your own to verify this, that employers are struggling right now to find people that can come in, their hygiene is proper, they don't look like slobs, they know how to talk to people. This stuff is so important. And so many people just like gloss over this. And I'm not meaning to pick on IT people here, but I've been around plenty of IT people. And let's just say uh, some of them in general don't have as good of people skills as other industries that I've been around. I've been around plenty of IT people that were really social, uh, really sociable. They had great social skills, but I've been around plenty that their social calibration was... Uh, it needed some work, I'll put it that way. So soft skills, this is a huge one. This one is so huge. I'm gonna spend some, okay, I'm just gonna spend some time talking about this before we get on to other stuff. Now, again, watch some YouTube videos. You can find videos of like employers on there talking about how this is stuff that they really need right now about how they're hurting for it. You can find it from like news channels or business owners that make their own YouTube channels. But think about it from this aspect. IT skills are really no different than a lot of other stuff. You can learn you can learn how to do the job. Everyone starts somewhere. Everyone starts from zero. That's the other thing that I'm going to mention real quick. That IT is an incredibly complex field. Everyone starts from somewhere. Don't get overwhelmed by anything that I'm talking about here and talk yourself out of being able to do this. There's millions of people that have gone before you and done it. You can do it as well. All, you, all it takes is for you to just sit down and do the work. But think about it from this perspective. Employers, they want to bring in someone that can communicate fine with other people. They're pleasant to be around. And well, that's really a lot of it is that you have people skills and that you're pleasant to be around. And again, you can go watch plenty of videos out there of employers talking about this. A lot of employers, they would prefer to hire and you can also look at this from the, your fellow employee perspective. A lot of people would rather work with someone who is really easy to get along with and maybe not as good at their job rather than opposed to someone who is super good at their job, but they're just an absolute asshole. They're so intolerant to be around. They're cranky, butt hurts all the time. People don't want to put up with that. And it's no different in the workplace. If you don't have those social skills, people are not going to want to be around you. So the soft skills is super important. And this really applies to just about any job right now. Yes, you need to have some hard skills. But soft skills really are more important right now than just about any other skill out there. Because a lot of employers are willing to teach people what they need to do the job. But you can't teach someone how not to be an asshole. If someone acts like a dick to everyone that they meet, and they're just unpleasant to be around, you can't train that out of someone. You can train someone how to do all this other stuff. Now, if you don't even know how to open a Word doc, it doesn't matter how good of, how pleasant of a person you are to be around. If you can't even open a Word doc, you're not going to make it in IT. But if you've got some good basic computer skills to start with, if you've got good soft skills, you'll be head and shoulders above a lot of people because so many people have forgot what it means to be pleasant to be around, to not be butt hurt all the time, so on and so forth. Next thing, problem solving. This is super important in the IT industry. And there's a joke, and I don't remember how the joke goes. It's been a while since I've seen it floating around. For example, system administrators. I've used this as a system administrator a lot. Google is a great way to problem solve. When you come up on some weird crash, let's say you're setting up a system and, and it just, there's this weird crash, you can't figure out what the hell's going on, or you know, you've got some other kind of problem going on. Google is great at problem solving, but you need to have good problem solving skills. You don't want to be running to your boss every 10 seconds and saying, hey, there's this goofy little problem I can't figure out. There's this little thing I can't figure out. Yes, you're going to ask tons of questions when you get hired into IT. 
Of course, make sure you know what you're doing. Don't ever make an assumption and then screw something up. So, I mean, there's a lot of nuance to what I'm saying here, but don't just go ask dumb questions. If it's something that is just a goofy little thing, like maybe making a change to something in, in group policies, making a minor change in group policy that your employer is like, hey, I need you to do this. And you're like, well, I'm not sure how to do that. Where a, a, a Google search could very well fix a problem or going to like Stack Overflow and checking through some threads there could very easily fix the problem. So you're not constantly pestering your, your boss trying to figure this stuff out. Again, you need to be asking a lot of questions anyway. Don't don't make an assumption and break something, especially in like a production environment, that's really important that you're not gonna be foobarring stuff. But problem solving skills are super, super, super important. And then just being able to do the work, this kind of ties into what I, a little bit of what I've talked about already. You need to be able to do the work though, like, if you want to get into the IT industry, let's say you're applying for jobs right now or you want to start applying to jobs pretty soon, but you don't know, like let's say how to go to Microsoft's website, download Microsoft Office and install Microsoft Office. If you don't even have that level, that is like the most basic level of stuff. If you don't even have that, you're not going to cut it in IT. And especially with the job environment that we're in right now, a lot of employers are not going to want to put in the time and effort to train somebody to be able to work past that point. If you're so lacking in IT skills that you don't even have that, and you really want to get into the IT field, again, millions of people have gone before you and done this, so you can do it. But what you're going to have to do is spend some time away from the employer. Don't expect your employer to teach you how to do the basic stuff like install Microsoft Office or open up an Excel doc or anything like that. I mean, that's all basic shit that you should know before you even go to a, a, a help desk interview. So what you're gonna have to do in that case is take the initiative, go to something like YouTube or U, Udemy or something like that, or Skillshare, there's tons of places out there, Take like an A-plus course, a CompTIA A-plus course. By the end of that, if you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the concentration, you're going to know a pretty decent amount of computers, uh, know a decent amount about computers. It's probably going to be 70 to 80%, put you in the top 70 to 80% of people because, you know, by the end of like an A-plus course, if you've been paying attention, you'll have those basics that you needed to know to be able to, to get into a help desk job. Okay. Next thing, options about being able to move up to different places. Options about being able to start, but also move up to different uh, specialties like DevOps or network engineer, whatever, what have you. First thing is gonna be experience. Now, before I ever got into IT, before I ever started getting paid to be in IT, I had a pretty damn good amount of experience walking into it. You know, I'll go into some of this stuff more in depth on another time. This big long story for another time. But when I was a kid, for example, I used to spend, you know, I'd go do my schoolwork and at like six, seven, eight years old, my dad used to have a lot of like Linux books and networking books and things like uh, the free BSD guides that had those weird, I don't, the, P, the, o, the ITOGs probably know what I'm talking about, but there was like this big series of books that had like these interesting, this interesting cover art on like the front of the books. They're like these paperback books that, you know, like there was the free BSD guide. And so I would spend literally hours at a time going and playing around with like free BSD, installing it, setting it up breaking stuff, fixing it, doing the same thing with like Linux and Windows. So I had a lot of IT experience before I ever even started getting paid for this. So, I mean, like I said, if you have enough experience where you could jump in and fill a role as a system administrator and you can skip over the hell desk, again, more power to you. I would say go for it. But in, experience is gonna play a pretty important role. You, you really need to have at least a little bit even if you're just going to go for like an entry level help desk job, you should know what a CPU is. You should know what a motherboard is. You should know what RAM is. You should know what a BIOS is. You should know how to navigate your way around a BIOS. You should know some of the basic stuff about like Windows and really probably some basic stuff about Linux. 
but you don't need a ton of experience to start. If you have a little bit, like I said, if you can, if you can navigate your way around pretty well, that's plenty. Next thing, certifications. This is a super hot, hot topic button for a lot of people in the IT industry. I could talk about this stuff for hours on end. At some point I'll do a video on certs, probably in the future. It's gonna be a ways down the road with all this other stuff that I'm working on right now. Certs are an interesting topic because what I uni almost universally what I will see is like, let's say somebody wants to get started with the help desk is I will see a lot of people recommend, hey, go and get your A+, go and get your Network+, plus or your Security+. plus. Those are all fine, and if you don't have any experience to start, I strongly, I think it would be a great idea to do it because you'll, you'll be tested on your knowledge, and, and it's really important to retain that knowledge, so you need to be actually going in and practicing stuff, like you learn something and then you practice it. Don't just go and, and do like this knowledge this brain dump it's called brain dump when a lot of people will go and spend like 20 hours straight studying for this stuff and then they go take the exam like two days later but then they forget it two weeks later and then they go to walk into a job interview and they look like complete clowns in front of the interview panel because they can't answer even the most basic questions because they didn't take any time to cement that knowledge in their head by going and actually putting it into practice so don't do something like brain dump but if you're going to go after certs, you don't have really any entry level knowledge. Getting something like A+, Network+, Security+, it's not gonna hurt you. It, okay, it's gonna benefit you. Do you need to have those to get into the help desk? No, but they're, they're gonna help you out. Now let's say you have a pretty good amount of knowledge about computers already, you could probably just skip that stuff. Like someone that's been playing around with computers for years on end, they've got like a home lab, whatever, you really don't even need to worry about something like an A+. For a lot of people that have that much experience, it would probably just be a big waste of their time and money to get an A+. That's where looking at something like RHCSA would be a lot more beneficial. But there are so many different paths with certs. There are so many different options out there. I can't really just give you a blanket recommendation. This one's going to take a little bit of research, and it's also going to depend on the track, like the specialty track that you want to go down what you end up getting for certs so if you're looking for me to give you specific recommendations I'm really not going to do that again if you have like zero experience something like an A plus I think would help you out a lot but if you already have a good amount of experience you could just get on the help desk without even having one and there are some people that go through basically their entire IT career I've seen this where like people will maybe only get like one or two certs and there's probably some very rare exceptions to that. But even examples where some people like basically don't even have any certs and they go through an, a, an IT career. So this is not something I can give a one size fits all answer on. This is something that you're going to have to figure out on your own. Do some research. If you wanna become like a system administrator, you gotta get good at doing research anyway because you're gonna come up on a lot of weird problems that come up in your day to day you've got to get good at research anyway. So no better time than the current to get started. Next thing, training. Well, training and, and learning, these kind of actually tie into each other, so I'll just move down to this line here. You don't ever want to stop with this stuff. I heard a really good example. Uh, it's been a while back, but it was something to the effect of if you walk in, if you were to walk into a doctor's office to do like a consult, you need like some sort of a procedure done. You walk into the doctor's office and he's got a sign just sitting there on his desk saying, my education stopped at college. I don't spend any time furthering my education, my self-education, any of that. I don't spend any time doing that. Very significant chance you will not want to use that doctor. You'll want to go try and find a different doctor because you're probably gonna be rightfully worried that something's gonna get screwed up. It's the very same thing with IT. This stuff changes so much. And again, I mentioned this earlier on, early in the video, you could spend like 50 hours a week doing IT for the next 40 years. And you could, you could specialize in one of these tracks here, you know, like let's say cybersecurity. You could spend 40, 50 hours a week for the next 40 years doing cybersecurity. There will still be more to learn. 
you always need to be learning. There's one of the aspects you have to think of is, is the half-life on the knowledge in your brain. I can't remember what it is. I think the half-life on brain, on the knowledge that you have in your brain is something like one to two years. So, I mean, just from that aspect alone, you need to make sure that you're constantly learning stuff, improving, going back over the basics, but also it's just the mindset. You need to have that mindset of constantly improving. This goes for every field out there. This isn't specific to IT. Like I said, this goes for doctors. This goes for construction workers. This goes for bakers. This goes for basically any trade, any sort of job or, or business out there. There's always going to be more to learn. Yes, I get that there's rare exceptions. And something I'm going to talk about here real quick. Don't think that you can just come into this field put in a minimal amount of effort and get a maximal reward out of it. This, I think a lot of people out there probably get what I'm trying to say right now, but I'm going to, again, this is pointed at beginners. And so let me phrase this to make it make sense here. Let's say the only thing that you've ever known is you work at like a fast food restaurant. So for example, a McDonald's or a Subway or something like that. Again, I'm not hating on people that work. You need to, everybody needs to, to have some sort of job or something to keep them busy or you're going to be miserable. But think of it from that aspect. So you go into work at like a McDonald's or Subway and all you're doing all day is you're learning how to make a, a sandwich or fry up a burger. Okay, so what do you put on a burger? You do, you, 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 I guess toast the buns probably, you cook the burger, you put on the lettuce, tomatoes, mustard, and, and mayonnaise, let's say. That is not hard to learn. I mean, you can learn that, and there's really not going to be a way that you can improve that further because it's a set process. The burgers are already there. The lettuce is already there. The mayo is already there. You're not making any of, this, any, like, any of the ingredients. You're just putting things together over and over again. So you can learn something like that really fast. And I have seen some people fall into this trap where they think they can just come in and learn something like overnight and then, oh, well, I'm good to go now. No, that's not how it works. And the, the thing that you need to keep in mind is in that instance, let's say you're going to move from like McDonald's to now you want to become, do something in the IT industry and you want to move into help desk. Even just going from like, putting burgers together to doing help desk, that is going to be a massive step up, like huge. Because the fact of the matter is help desk does do quite a bit of stuff. You do need to have pretty good IT knowledge. By the time that you could even get out of help desk, you're probably going to have a pretty good IT skill set. So it's kind of thing where you need to make sure you're learning constantly, because like I said, the, the half-life, the fact that there's so much in the IT industry uh, to learn, and the, it also comes down to, it takes effort. It takes time. It takes effort. You can't do this stuff overnight. You can't spend 10 or 20 hours doing something and then think you're good to go and then go and do well. And then, well, okay, now I made, you know, I'm getting paid 20 bucks an hour to work the help desk. I've done it for three months. Okay, now I'm going to go be a system administrator and get paid 35 to $40 an hour. And I'm good with just three months of help desk experience. That's not the way that it works. Maybe there, maybe there's some people that can do that. They almost always get weeded out. If they do that, they almost always get weeded out very quickly. They either fired or they quit because they're like, shit, I am in way over my head. And so as far as, let me also cover dealing with the tedium. Every job has this at least to an extent. You know, in the construction industry, for example, I have really enjoyed construction. There's something about doing framing. I, I don't do like drywall. I don't do finish work, mainly because I've never really spent the time to get into the finish work. Framing is where I've basically had all of my construction experience. You know, and there's certain things that are really nice takeaways from that. Like at the end of the day or end of the week, you can look back and say, oh, you know, I helped build this house. You know, that, that helps deal with some of the tedium of constantly like, okay, got to put together a new wall here. Got to get the, the headers put together. Got to figure out where the cripples need to go. Okay, the kings go here. Got to put the, got to make sure to put the fire blocking in. All this, got to put the sheeting on, all this stuff. 
but doing that time after time after time after time, yeah, it can get tedious. And the, the IT industry is basically the same thing. Like on the help desk, you can expect to time after time after time have people call up and say, hey, my printer's not working. I need you to fix my printer. Time after time, you're going to have to do things like reinstall drivers or make some sort of a change with system settings or whatever. You know, there's a million things you're going to run into. If you can learn to be able to enjoy that, you'll have a lot more fun. And this, what I'm talking about with tedium also ties in with the never stop learning and also ties in with how much effort that it takes to learn stuff in the IT field. So for example, you know, in the past, I remember a couple of weekends where, you know, I was going and doing all my, all my other work and then I come home and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn about encrypting encrypted DNS, using it like DNS filtering, encrypted DNS, the difference between DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, DNS over Quick, DNS Crypt. Like I was learning everything that I could about DLS and I remember spending, it was like one weekend where I spent like both days for like 10, 12 hour days just going and playing around with DNS. And then I did it again the next weekend. And then there were weekends where I literally spent hours at a time going in changing things in group policy. And then I reboot a computer, all oh, that broke it all. Oh, I'm in recovery mode now. Well, I got to fix it. Okay, so I can't do, make this change to group policy unless I've done this. There is so many intricacies with the IT industry. And this, what I'm saying is you've got to be able to start, you have to be able to enjoy the day-to-day, -day, the tedious stuff that you're going to deal with in the IT industry and I have a lot of fun. You know, you could look at the videos that I've done recently. When I was on YouTube before, I mean, my videos were absolute garbage and that's, you know, I, you can't find any of them now because I deleted them. I've been having a lot of fun back on YouTube and what you'll see from the videos that I make is I can make a 30 minute video, no problem, talking about, oh, here's how to encrypt DNS. Here's how to set up Firefox to be the most private and secure. It took a long time to learn how to do all this stuff, but I also have a lot of fun doing it. If you don't have fun doing this stuff, you know, you're probably not gonna have a lot of fun when you first start out. I'll, I'll put it that way. And, and there are things like, oh, I, there's a reason that it's called hell desk. Like even as a system administrator, I still had to deal with a lot of this stuff. Is having people call up like, hey, my printer's not working, and then you gotta go fix like screwed up printer drivers or something else on Windows broke or an update went bad. There are times like, I will say, having to take phone calls from people that have like no IT experience, and then they call you up and they get all butt hurt. Oh, well, this isn't working, this system's not working, whatever. Doing that time and time again, I'm gonna keep it real with you. You're probably not gonna enjoy that. Hopefully when you get, if you go to work a help desk, hopefully you get on, uh, hopefully the end users that you get are going to be pretty decent to deal with. But I have heard a ton of horror stories out there. I've heard of like, especially like MSPs that had like attorney's offices, for example. And, you know, I've heard like, I mean, that's just one example. There's plenty of other examples out there that you could pull up. But I've, in particular, like I've heard of a few people that worked help desk at like an MSP and they had like attorney clients and the attorneys would just call up. You know, the attorneys acting like they're better, they're smarter than everybody else and they have this, this attitude about them and then they call up and act rude. You know, dealing with people like that, it's not gonna be fun. I, again, I'm just keeping it real with you. There's gonna be plenty of aspects about doing this that you're not gonna like. You know, let's say, like system administrator is a lot of fun. I, I absolutely, for me, like system administrator, I'm pivoting more towards cybersecurity at this point in my life, but system administrator is a lot of fun. For me, there's some people that really like being like a network engineer. When you get started out in help desk though, again, I'm just, I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. It's probably not going to be the most exciting thing, but you're just gonna have to push through it. But you should be able to enjoy, to go back to the point that I was originally making, you should enjoy at least most of what you're doing. You know, I'd, I'd say this about any job out there. I enjoy doing construction work. I really like framing. I hate drywalling. You will not catch me drywalling because I hate doing it. I've tried it, I hate it. I don't particularly care for finished work. That's probably because I've never put much effort into really trying to learn it. 
but I enjoy framing. I think it's fun. I think it's fun that at the end of the day, you can see, oh, well, we started with a foundation and now we've got most of the place walled. We've got most of the walls up. Like at the end of the day, it's fun. Or it's, it's, a, it's an accomplishing feeling being able to create something, to build something. And if you can take that sort of mentality, that sort of process into the line of work with IT and, and tell yourself, oh, you know, I, I, um, I put together this, uh, these 10 computers that are gonna go out to end users and, you know, maybe not as fulfilling as like being able to see a building being built and, and you know, you see like solid, huge progress at the end of the day, but, you know, maybe you take a lot of enjoyment or you find a way to take a lot of enjoyment and knocking out 50 help desk tickets a day or, and like I said, or putting 10 computers together that are going to be going to people's offices. You know, you got 10 people who want to work from home and they need company computers set up. Find ways to enjoy the work that you're doing. If you hate what you're doing, I don't understand why people spend years upon years upon years of their life working jobs, being miserable. If you're miserable with what you're doing, life is too damn short to be miserable. And if you think about it from this aspect, you've got 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. Okay, so you've got to take eight hours out because you need to get a good night's sleep. If you're one of those people that can function on four hours of sleep a night, you know, well, more power to you, but most people need eight hours to properly function. Like, well, it's actually like six to eight or something like that, but let's say you need eight hours. That's, so that's a third of your life you're going to spend sleeping. Okay, you got to have that. Then let's say you work 40. Well, if you're going to be in the IT industry, all the things that we've talked about in this video is I'm sure you've probably kind of figured out for, from by now is you're probably going to need more than like 40 hours a week because if you work 40 at your job, you should probably be spending about 10 to 12 hours a week at home learning to get you to the next specialty track that you want to go down. So let's say you spend, you're going to spend about a third of your life work, but because you're sleeping, let's take sleep out of it. So now you, you've got to change the equation a little bit. Okay, now I spend half my life at work, half my life is free time. So don't be miserable. I don't understand why so many people, I've seen it in the IT industry, I've seen it in every other industry, people spend so much of their life being miserable. I don't understand why people do this to themselves. Don't, if you're miserable, make a change. If you have to, do something completely different. If you hate IT work, go do something else. Learn a different, a different trade or, or different skill and go do something else. If you hate what you're doing and you really wanna get into IT, apply yourself, put in the work, and I can guarantee you there, there are so few people these days that are doing the work. There are so few people these days that are trying. They're actually putting an honest effort that if you put in honest effort, you'll stand out above basically almost the rest of the crowd. I mean, maybe today is a little more of an exception than like the last couple of years because now there's so many people that need work and they're really fighting to try and find a job, but this really applies. So anyway, I'm gonna move off of that now. I think I've really hammered that enough. I'll probably come back to it at a later point, but again, find a way to enjoy your work, number one. Number two, don't be miserable your first couple months in IT, you're probably gonna get your ass handed to you. If you don't, I'll just cover this real quick and then we'll move on. Your first couple months, let's say you have very little or no IT experience. Well, if, you need, if you're gonna get an IT, you've gotta have some, but let's say you're working with very little IT experience and you move into help desk. Let's say you're working in a busy place. You know, let's, let's say you get a job at the help desk at an MSP. At an MSP, you're probably gonna be taking a ton of tickets. So, you know, your first couple months, you're probably gonna get your ass handed to you. It's probably gonna suck, but it should get better after that. You, just keep in mind, you're probably going to be pretty overwhelmed when you first start. But if you're a year in, two years in, and you're just miserable, don't, don't do that to yourself. Don't do it to yourself and don't do it to the people that are around you because it's also gonna rub off on the people that are around you. If you're going into work and you're being miserable, I've had this at jobs in the past, and it takes maybe some level of self-awareness to realize this because, I, like I said, I've dealt with it myself, but I've had this in jobs in the past. And if you're getting to become just a miserable person to be around in general, just go do something else. Don't take it out on your coworkers. Don't take it out on your boss. And really, 
if you can't do it for other people, then at least do it for yourself and don't make yourself miserable. Just move on and figure something else out. There's, again, there's, there's way too much in life to be miserable. Okay. Now we're going to talk about, of everything that I've talked about so far, we're coming up on some of the most important stuff. So uh, I'll probably just like drop a, a timestamp that way and, and mark it like this is a really important section. This is super important. This applies not only if you're trying to get a job in IT, this applies to basically every job out there. This stuff is super, super, super important. Don't overlook this stuff. There's so many people that will think, oh, well, I just need IT skills. And they skip over all of this other stuff. And then they're like, oh, hey, I've been applying to jobs now for like the last four or five months. I've got the, I've got A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Sec+, plus, and I still can't even get a job interview. And it's because they skip over this stuff. This is the probably the most important part of everything that I've talked about. So this, you really need to pay attention to this part. So we'll talk about... We'll talk about these different aspects, and this is not all inclusive, but we're already coming up on almost an hour in this video. I've been talking nonstop and for like an hour at this point, and my voice is probably going to go at some point. So we need to we need to start getting into and covering some of this stuff. First thing, intentions. I probably should have worded this a little bit differently before I before I made this like this outline here. Intentions are super important. There's a lot of psychology at play here, and first of all, actually before I go any further, let's talk about psychology a little bit before we start getting into any of this stuff. I've talked a little bit already about likability. I'll talk about it a little more, uh, a little more now, and how it relates to kind of like the psychology of the workplace, psychology of getting jobs, being able to get promoted or move to another industry and get paid more money, whatever. A lot, a lot of psychology plays into this. And likability is something that's really important. Intention is really important. But, but to talk about psychology a little bit, I've spent a lot, of, a lot of time on this topic. And I'll probably do a video talking about this more in depth at some point in the future because this is such an important thing that people overlook. And again, it, it, this comes down to like a soft skill and you really need this. One of the best books that I ever read is uh, one called The Like Switch. It was written by a retired FBI agent. And in the start of the book, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm just, I'm going to give you this. The book starts out with the, the author, he was talking about this story of how he flipped a, a Russian or a Soviet spy. And he goes through the the tactics and strategies that he used and <clears throat> basically the psychology behind everything like what he did why he did it and all of that and basically the whole book the like switch talks about this kind of stuff like applied psychology like how do you get people to like being around you more how do you get people uh and how do you get certain people to want to be around you and stuff like that? And that's super important. And so many people overlook how important this aspect is of psychology. And so likability is a big thing. One of the things, this is so, I really want to drop an F-bomb to emphasize how important this is. But likability is so damn important. And so many people overlook this. You should be likable to be around. And I see this a lot with people saying like, oh, well, this person's just a brown noser. Okay, well, maybe look at it from the aspect of you're just a dick to be around and the other person is actually likable and the people in the office and the boss like being around that person because they're likable. You should be a likable person. Don't act like a dick. People like to be around those that they get along with. And I can tell you it's... I mean, even like in my early 20s, I was able to get jobs that I probably shouldn't have been able to get, but I got them because I had that likability factor. You know, I come across like on this video, I've come across as like super, super blunt, super stern in your face, but it's because I'm trying to deliver a point. You know, if you were to hang out with me and we got to the point where we knew each other, I'm pretty damn chill and relaxed and laid back. 
And having the ability for people to like you will go a long ways. It will go a long ways in you being able to get a job. It also goes a long ways in you being able to keep a job. And don't mistake it for, for brown nosing. I see some people say, and there are like people that legit do brown nosing. Don't be that point. Don't be that person. You can be very likable, but not be a brown noser. There's maybe there's like a, a sort of a line to walk there and you should always be professional. You shouldn't get, there's probably some exceptions to this, but typically you don't want to become close friends with your boss. There's a lot of reasons for that. I think the, the people that have a lot of life experience probably know where I'm going with this when I say that, but if you're pretty new to, if you're pretty new to the employment market, I mean, you don't really want to become close friends with your boss. There should be that professional boundary there. But likability is super important. This is gonna come through in your job interview. This is gonna come through in showing up to the job. So you need to have this. Next thing is intentions. This is super important. This is something a lot of people overlook when they go into a job interview is they don't set their intentions. This is part of that psychology thing that I've talked about a little bit. You need to, and when I say intentions, here's what I'm saying, and why this is so important when you get into the interview. Set your intentions. Let your employer know what it is that you want to do. There are so many people that don't do this because they think they're, they're worried about, you know, maybe they don't have enough confidence to say what they're going to say, and that's a big thing. Like, you've got to get some confidence. If you're not a confident person, the only way that you can get over that is to put yourself in really uncomfortable situations and just push through it. I can tell you there's a lot of people out there, myself, included when I was younger I struggled to get through job interviews you've got to be able to go into this stuff with some confidence if you don't it's gonna you're gonna sabotage yourself and you're going to get passed up for jobs I see people in their 30s 40s 50s they don't go into things with confidence you need to go in there with that stone cold confidence like yeah I can do this damn job don't go in there cocky like Oh, I know everything. Don't be that person. That's just going to piss people off and, you know, people aren't going to want to be around you. But you got to have some confidence. And one of the things that I'm going to add to this is let's say, I'm going to move a little bit here. Been going for basically an hour at this point. One of the things that you got to be able to go in and do, let's say you get through the job interview. Okay, you, you make your intentions known because your employer, a lot of employers are going to ask you, well, where do you see yourself in five years? What would you like to be doing in the IT industry in five years? Just tell them, be like, you know, in five years, I would like to be a network engineer or uh, in three years, I want to be a system administrator or whatever the case is. Set your intentions there. Tell them what your intentions are. But also what I say intentions is it, at the end of the interview, you got to have some confidence to be able to deliver this. And if we're going to do this, deliver it with confidence. Don't say it sheepishly because it's actually going to do you more harm than good. But say it with confidence. When you're at the end of the interview, okay, let's say the job interview has gone well and you think it'd be a good fit at the job, you want the job. Let them know your, your in, in, intention as to what it is that you're trying to do. Be like, uh, come across in a way, word it in a way, I don't, I don't wanna give you the exact wording that I use because knowing how people are, they're gonna try and use my exact wording and then it's gonna fall flat on your face. You need to use this according to like your, how you speak, you need to word it in your own way, but say, you know, something to the effect of at the end of your job interview, you know, if you really think this is a place you want to work and you can deliver on what they're asking, say something to the effect of, hey, you know, I just want to say thank you for the interview and I want to let you know what my intentions are. I would like to be able to come work here. I think I can deliver on what it is that you're asking for and I think we would be a benefit to each other and I would add value to your organization. Say it with a lot of confidence. Think, again, don't use what I said. You need to use your own words. Think about it, word it in your own way. But a lot of people do not do this, and you would be surprised. At the end of the interview, you need to deliver that. that I don't think the, it was covered in the like switch. It was covered in some other psychology stuff that I've, that I've covered, but setting your intentions is super important, and it goes a long, long ways. That was just something I wanted to throw out about because like as far as getting a job, if you can if you can deliver this stuff with confidence, it's gonna help you. I'm just saying. Next thing, body language. 
This one is super important. All, all of this stuff that I'm, that I'm talking about that I'm about to mention is really important. Body language is a really important one because there's this study out there, and I don't remember what the percentages are, but it's something like communication is something like 80 or 90% non-verbal, and then the other is like, it's like 10% verbal or something to that effect. Body language matters a ton. So <clears throat> let's say you walk in to go interview for a job. And the, let's say the boss or manager, whoever interviews you, they see you walk in the office. You've got slumped over, you know, you've got that hunched, hunchback, slumped over posture, or you, you just have this really timid persona about you. Maybe there's times where that could benefit you. It's probably gonna be pretty rare. You need to have some, some swag in your body language. You need to have some confidence. You need to have that air of, I know what I'm doing, I can deliver. Again, don't be, don't be cocky. There's, there's probably a pretty fine line between being confident and being cocky, but don't be cocky. Like That just pisses people off and people don't wanna put up with that. But there's enough difference between being confident and being cocky. But walk in with good body language. You will send a lot of subliminal, what's the matter, like subliminal messaging, or. I, that's maybe the words that I want to use. Like you're sending like a lot of subliminal messaging when you walk in and you don't have any confidence to you. You don't have that air of this person walks with a purpose. They speak with a purpose. They act with intention. That stuff is super important. I can't really cover it really any more thoroughly than that. It's super important though that you get this stuff right. Next thing, I've talked about this, this kind of plays into likability a little bit, but there's some different facets to it. Go do some research on this on your own. There's plenty of psychologists out there that talk about this stuff. Social calibration is really important. This is basically, if I could sum it up as basically as possible, would be don't act like a dork. That's like a super dumbed down explanation of it, but social calibration is really important. Like you need to know, okay, now's not a good time to try and make a joke. You need to think, okay, you need to be able to read people's body language and sit and think, oh, this person, I can tell from their body language, I can tell from what they're saying, this person's not having a good day. It wouldn't be a good idea for me to bring this problem to their attention or you know, the, the boss is having a bad day and, you know, I was going to talk to him about trying to get a promotion, but, you know, it's not a good time right now. I'm going to wait until, you know, tomorrow or next week when he's, when he's back on track and in a better headspace. Knowing that certain things are inappropriate and they shouldn't be said at certain times. And I'm not talking like sexual stuff. I'm just talking in general. There are times to say things and there are times to not say things. That's social calibration. And if you, the problem with social calibration, I would recommend going and, and watching some psychology videos on this. There are some really good psychologists out there. Dr. David Buss is one. Andrew Huberman is one that I've seen recommended quite a bit by a lot of people. But go watch some stuff on social calibration. The, the issue with social calibration, the issue with likability, the issue with body language, all this stuff, this takes practice. You can't just read a book and learn how to do it. You can't just, and you can't just get through like half a dozen social interactions and think that, oh, I'm a very socially calibrated person. This takes some effort. And if you haven't had much practice doing this stuff, it's gonna take some time. Again, everyone starts somewhere. If you're not, if you're an awkward person to be around, if you're kind of dorky, there's absolutely no reason that you can't get through a job interview and go on to make a ton of money in IT. There's plenty of people that have done it. Again, millions of people have gone before you and done it. There's no reason for you to not be able to pull it off and do the same. It's just gonna take some effort. And as far as you know, things like likability. So that book that I talked about, The Like Switch. I'm gonna cover this about books and about learning and also it's gonna tie into likability real quick. So when I was going through reading that book, 
what I was doing was actively going out and putting that stuff into practice. So the guy would talk about certain behavior, certain mannerisms, and what I would do is go, for example, one of the things I would do is go walk around my neighborhood and I would change the way that I would dress. I would change the way that I walked, uh, like the way that I carried myself. And I would start to notice like the difference in the way that the people in the neighborhood, like people who would just be out in their yards, I would notice a change in the way that people would look at me, the way that they would kind of act. Like if I was acting suspicious, if I dressed in a certain way that, you know, made it seem like I was a suspicious person, yes, that drawed a lot of suspicion from people. If I acted in a manner like where I was very laid back and I was dressed like, you know, I wasn't like a, a turd and I, I was dressed, you know, decently. You know, one of the things I would experiment with, like, was would be walking around these neighborhoods in the morning, like, just walking around with a coffee cup. <laughs> that, was, that was the level that I would go to to learn this stuff. And that's what you're going to have to do to be able to learn this stuff and really apply it. You're going to have to put this stuff into practice. <clears throat> the other thing with all of this, I don't have the quote available. I was looking around for it and I couldn't find it. I think it was from Mark Twain, but it might have been from somebody else. The quote was something to the effect of, I can't remember, this isn't the exact wordings, it was something to this effect, that I can't remember all of the books that I've read through all the years that have gone by, but those books have made me into the person that I am today. And so the like switch, for example, most of it, I couldn't tell you what was in that book because it's been long enough since I've read it, but I put so much of it into practice that it became part of the person that I am. And I mean, that had so many benefits for me. And, and it was, it's different. You know, so many people read books. What you should do is change your mindset and use books, use courses. You know, a lot of people talk shit on courses like, oh, this person's just trying to get rich. Are there people that are like that? Sure. But if you just apply that mentality across the board, that's stupid and you're holding yourself back because there, I can tell you, I've taken plenty of good IT courses. Like, Let's say you go take an IT course and you go learn a module and then you go and practice that module. You put all that into effect. Think of that quote that I was just telling you. That becomes part of who you are. So me being likable to other people, I don't have to think about it. It's just part of who I am. Me being able to do stuff with computers, it's not part of who, or it's, it's not something that I really have to think about. A lot of it is just, I've done it so many times, I could do it in my sleep, basically. That's the mindset that you have to adopt is, and if you make that change, that will help you out a lot, is I, I'm no longer going to read books, I'm going to use books, or I'm no longer going to take a course, I'm going to use a course. That stuff is super important. Okay, now we get into, we're gonna talk about boundaries. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm gonna clip, I'm gonna chop this clip up and give it its own separate video because this is so important. Of everything that I've talked about in this video, this is by far one of the most important things that I'm going to talk about. I cannot emphasize this enough that you need to set healthy boundaries. I'm sure a lot of people can think of this, but there's one of the ways that I could explain this is. You can see this in employer-employee relationships. You can see this in like dating relationships. How, like take dating for example, how two people will be dating and one person treats the other person terribly. But then the person that, that treated that person bad will go and get in a relationship with another person and treat that person like a gold nugget. The reason for that is because of the boundaries that are set. One person lets themselves get treated like garbage, whereas the other person has boundaries. Hey, if you talk to me this way, if you treat me this way, if you act this way, I'm gonna cut you off. There is no exceptions. You will not be rude or disrespectful towards me. It's because they set good, healthy boundaries. And so many people miss this. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about the dating stuff. What I'm gonna talk about today you know, you can use this in your personal relationships like family or dating or whatever. I'm going to cover today from the aspect of employer-employee relationships and why these boundaries are so damn important and so many people get this stuff wrong and part of it is because they don't have the confidence to set these boundaries. 
Confidence is super important and you need to have it to set boundaries. You have to set proper, healthy boundaries with people. So <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I'll give you a story and then we're gonna go in depth on, on how to, I guess, kind of apply this to yourself. So I'll give you an example. So all the OGs on my channel probably remember me talking back, uh, way, way back, that I used to be a volunteer firefighter. I did that for a few years. I was 18 years old at the time. I was pretty young. I was fairly new-ish to the job market. I'd been working jobs for like a few years by that point. But I was pretty young, 18 years old, didn't have much life experience. I was working a minimum wage job. And I was like, you know what? I wanna have a little bit of, a, of like adrenaline rush, do something fun. So I've decided, I was like, I'm gonna become volunteer firefighter. So I was doing like firefighting and EMT training. Well, I got hired at this job. So I got hired at this job like right after I got on with the fire department. And I remember I told these people up front, this was a minimum wage crappy, like fast food place. I told them up front, hey, just so you know, I was uh, a volunteer firefighter that I had all this training that I needed to get to. And you know, it was a big commitment on the part of the fire department because they spent thousands of dollars on people to equip them, to train them, to pay for workman's comp insurance, all this other stuff. It was a big commitment for them to put all that trust and faith that an 18 year old was going to do what he said he was gonna do and show up to the training and then actually like start showing up to calls. So I was a few months into the job by this point. I went to EMT training one night. Now for those who have never been an EMT, there are state and federal requirements to be an EMT. You have to get a certain amount of training hours you have to have competencies. There's, there's a licensure process. You have to pass all these tests. You can't, you know, it's not like a college class. You can't just miss a bunch of classes. Okay, so the fire department had to pay for me to be able to go to this EMT class. I told them that I was going to go there. I gave them my word. I gave them my commitment that I was going to be there. And I made it there every damn night when we were doing training. And so I was about two, or three, I was probably about three weeks into training by this point, I had been at this job for several months and they knew that I was going to firefighter in EMT training almost every night. So I've been at this job for a few months. They knew what my training schedule was. It was set in stone. Nothing was getting changed. There was a class of like 30, 40 people all doing the same schedule. It wasn't this haphazard thing. I made, I set the intentions clear. Hey, I'm gonna be here going to this training. So I ended up getting a message. I think it was like either a few hours or something. It was like a day before or something like that. The, there were two managers there. I didn't respect either of these dudes. These dudes were both clowns. They had gone absolutely nowhere in life and they, they tried to, I could tell from the, their, their behaviors and their actions, they didn't like that I was going places. Okay, it was that jealousy aspect. Oh, this, this guy's gonna come in and he's gonna blow right past us. You know, there's the, there's the thing that I've heard a lot that for a lot of people, when they see you doing better than them, it's like them looking in the mirror and they see the reflection of themselves, the reflection of themselves that they're a screw up and that they haven't accomplished nearly what they could. And again, don't take this as me bashing on people that have a minimum wage job. If that's, if you're fine doing that, fine, whatever. But these guys were a couple of clowns and they got pissed off. So they sent me this this message saying, hey, there's gonna be an employee meeting and everyone's required to be there and it's mandatory. And I told them, I said, I'm not going to be there. I have EMT training. And these two morons were basically, they said, well, you need to be there or you're gonna be in trouble. So I go to EMT training, completely ignore these, these dickheads, okay? I don't respect, that's the other thing. If you're gonna be a boss, I'm just gonna tell you this real quick. You need to be respected by your other employees. Respect is earned, not given. You need to put yourself in a position where you're respected by your employees because if your employees don't respect you and they think you're a clown, you're gonna have a hell of a lot harder time managing people. I see so many managers out there that think they're, they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, that think that just because they have the title of manager that they can just tell somebody to do something and that person's gonna do it. That ain't how the world works. Anyway, so I'm at training. I was about an hour into the evening by this point. I get a message on my phone and the managers are super butthurt and they said, you're not here, where are you at? And I said, I am at EMT training, like I said I was going to be. 
And they got furious. They got butthurt and said, we need you to come in and talk tomorrow because you're going to be getting a write-up and we need to have a discussion about moving things forward. And so I go in the next day, the boss shows up, the owner of the, the, the fast food place shows up. So he's there with one of the managers. And I showed up there in the morning and we had a conversation and I was very blunt and very to the point with both of these clowns. I was absolutely furious with both of them that they would even talk about writing me up because I made my intentions clear ahead of time that I was not going to be at their stupid ass meeting, that I was going to get paid minimum wage. At that time, I was like five or six bucks an hour, get paid five or six bucks an hour to show up and completely disrupt the commitment that I had made to uh, the fire department to show up to the EMT class. And so my, the, the boss and the manager were there. They get butthurt, but I stood my ground and I said, you know, basically to keep things short, we had a little bit of a discussion, but to keep things short, I said, I'm not going to apologize and I'm going to keep going to training and I'm not going to show up to meetings if they conflict with my training. This is a minimum wage job. And I made a commitment to the, to the fire department. I enjoy that way more. And I also had this thing in the back of my mind, even at 18 years old, that this job is replaceable. That job was such a joke. That was so stupid. And, you know, the, the manager seemed really butthurt that I stood up for myself. But the boss, the, the owner, I think he respected the position. So basically, I never got written up. And I think the, in a way, at least it seemed to me, and maybe I misread this correctly, it seemed like the boss maybe respected me a little bit for at least standing up for myself and saying, hey, I'm not showing up for some stupid ass mandatory meeting at a job where I already know how to do. And like I said, it's one of those jobs where you're putting food together. There ain't nothing to it. We don't need to have dumb ass meetings, call people in from all where they live for a one hour meeting to get paid. It costs more in fuel than it would to go there and waste an hour talking about garbage. And so, so that was basic, so that's, that's the story. And, and I wanna tie that into what I'm talking about with boundaries. And this is really important. And I'm gonna tell you guys that at some point, there's gonna be a lot of employers that will probably test you at this at some point. And it's going to come down to, are you going to hold your ground or are you going to cave in? Because I can tell you a lot of them are going to look for you to cave in. If I would have caved in, in that instance, talking about the, the EMT class, if I would have caved in, they would have just, I mean, the, the amount of disrespect that I got there would have been times 10, because then they would have known that they could have got away with anything. If I would have gone in there and said, hey, I'm sorry, or hey, I'm gonna show up to your little stupid bullshit meetings in the future, I stood my ground, I made a hard line in the sand, I am not going to compromise. We are not going to negotiate this. We are not going to discuss this. Disrespect really pisses me off. But you're going to get employers out there that are going to, at some point, a lot of employers. Some of them may, if you set boundaries, a lot of employers will probably respect those. But make no mistake, there will absolutely be employers who are going to push those. They're going to see if you hold fast, if you hold strong. This takes confidence. And I'm also going to say that if you do this, there's a chance that you could get fired or you could get written up or demoted, whatever the case may be. So if you're going to have boundaries, you need to have the confidence to stand your ground and back those up. Don't apologize for what you do. If you know you're in the right, you need to stick with it. And I'll also say this about boundaries because especially in today's world, you know, I. I've seen this since I've been in the labor market, but in today's world, it applies now more than ever. You have to set boundaries because givers have to set boundaries because the takers never do. The takers will take as much as they can. And if you end up with a disrespectful piece of shit asshole boss who is constantly trying to uh, demean you, disrespect you, trying to uh, basically be an out of line asshole, if they can get away with it, there's plenty of employers that will. So this is what I'm saying when you need to, you need to have boundaries and you need to push those. And there's been times that it's been difficult for me to stand up to an employer because, you know, I'd, I'd have a job where I was getting paid a pretty good amount of money. I had a great benefit. I've had jobs where I've had great benefits packages where my hourly pay was pretty damn good. But I do not compromise on my boundaries. Those are set in stone. If you, I don't care how big of a, of a boss you are, 
If you step over those, I will damn sure let you know. Now, I've had some employers, I can tell you, I've had this work out three different ways in the past. I've had some people, some like managers, employers, whatever. I've had some people that were just kind of neutral. You know, maybe they just didn't really give it any thought. Maybe they didn't even realize that they were pushing a boundary. I don't know. I've had employers that have reacted very negatively to it and they got super butt hurt and basically it just destroyed the work environment for me to be around them because it's like, well, I'm not budging. And if you're not gonna budge, you know, it's like the meme, uh, an immovable object meets an unstoppable force. Okay, if I know my job, I know how to do my job and I'm getting my job done, don't be trying to, to disrespect me. And this is something that's really important that you have to learn how to do. But the other thing is I've also had employers that responded positively to this. And I think it goes, it plays into the psychology of, well, this person actually stands up for themselves. They have confidence in themselves. They're going to hold their ground. I think, maybe I could be wrong. I think that's what kind of played into when I got a positive feedback from when I've stood my ground. That would be my guess is that, you know, these employers have never had someone with the confidence, the balls to stand up to them when they were acting out of line and acting a fool. And if you're an employer, if you're a manager and you're watching this right now and you're butt hurt over what I'm saying, you can take a stick and you can go shove up your ass because I don't give a flying fuck about if this pisses you off. Because I do, will say I've seen a lot of employers post videos on YouTube. I've seen a lot of this stuff get posted on LinkedIn of these employers who disrespect their employees because you don't respect people and you don't have boundaries. What I'm really making this video t for though is for the employees because I cannot emphasize, again, of everything I've talked about in this video, having good boundaries is one of the most important parts. And I'm going to tell you, once you set those boundaries, again, I'm going to reinforce this, at some point you're gonna end up with an employer who's going to push those. They're going to see if you hold fast. If you buckle, you might as well count your, the rest of your days there as just complete misery because your employer will disrespect you. They will think to themselves, oh, this person's a pushover, I can just act like a disrespectful asshole to them. When you set those boundaries, you need to hold fast and not not give in. And sometimes that might mean that you end up having to go find a different job. Because if your employer is going to continue to push his boundaries and, and get butt hurt because you enforce your boundaries, at that point, if your employer is going to keep pushing that, you're basically the only options you're going to have left is to go find a different job. Does it suck? Yes, that's the job market. Hey, sometimes it's like stepping on a minefield. Sometimes you're going to walk into a crappy job. It's like stepping on a mine. And, you know, you just have to deal with it. There's been plenty of us, myself included, that, you know, a lot of people that have ended up with crappy employers. You just got to move on. <laughs> but I would never, ever recommend that you put up with disrespect. Because if you put up with disrespect, it's going to lower your self-esteem. You're going to think less of yourself. And, and the more self-esteem that you lose for yourself, the more you're going to struggle through life in general. If you let it, a boss disrespect you at work, that I can guarantee you, that is going to spill over into your personal life. It's going to spill over into your personal relationships. Don't let employers walk all over you. You need to have those boundaries. And you know, again, if that means you need to tell them to shove it up their ass and you need to go find another job, then so be it. I think there's plenty of people that have had to go through that experience. But if you're gonna be one of these people that you don't set boundaries and then you get butt hurt and you're one of these people that go on these IT forums, and you say, hey, I'm having this problem with my boss. I got like a 10 cent raise, but this other person that's doing the exact same job as me got hired. They're making $15,000 a year more than me. Why? My, my employer won't fix it. That's why. You didn't set those damn boundaries and your, your employer just basically doesn't respect you. You need to hold fast on this stuff. One last thing I'm gonna talk about in this video, because we're at an hour and a half, my, I can tell my voice is starting to go out at this point, I've been talking nonstop. Last thing, this is, <clears throat> this is a very, very, this requires a lot of finesse and a lot of practice. This goes into the psychology of where you need to get good at reading people, you need to get good at body language, all that kind of stuff. Not giving a F is extremely, important. I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> this is a very fine line to walk and it's going to take a while. 
if you haven't done this before, it takes a while to get to this point. It, in a way, it kind of it kind of ties into boundaries because, you know, with boundaries, if your boss gets butt hurt at you, you basically have to not give an f what they're gonna think, and that you basically have the power to tell them to shove it. But this kind of is something a little bit different. <clears throat> And for those of you out there who have done this, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that have not, like I said, this is a very fine line. I'm not saying do this because it could get you fired. You really have to be calibrated to know when you can get away with this and how much of it you can get away with. And I'm not encouraging people to be lazy. I'm not encouraging people to be bums. I'm not encouraging people to do the bare minimum effort. Don't take this the wrong way because I know I have to throw that disclaimer out there because of course there's gonna be people that misread what I'm about to say. So now that I've done that disclaimer, if I see you make a stupid comment down in the comment section, I'm gonna give you the pin of shame and call you out. But <clears throat> when I say not giving a F, here's what I mean by that. I have noticed this trend. I started practicing this a lot more when I got my early 20s. I, I didn't realize that I had been practicing it. I kind of had that almost like this mindset of, of not giving an F, but it kind of developed more and became more fine-tuned as I got into my early 20s. And then, like the time I got my late 20s, I really started get like having this thing dialed in. This is almost kind of difficult to explain in a way, but the best way that I can put it is that the more, the more you care the more your employer is going to give you grief. That's this is hard to word, and the people that have done this know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe this isn't the best example, but the way that I can think of it is, let's say, uh, let's say you're working in an office environment, you got six people that you work with, you got six people on your team and you got a manager working over you. And there's a bunch of work that needs to get done, and you know, the, you've got the lowest common denominators in the office. They suck ass at what they do. They're, they're lagging behind. You're having to pick up the pieces after them. Here's, here's where I'm going with this. If you can get to a point where, let's say, in this case, you've got uh, uh, coworkers who are not carrying their weight. I've seen a lot of people that will pick up that weight for them. Now, I've seen times where the employer will mandate it and... Again, it, this is a boundary that, that I set. If you want to set it for yourself, that's up to you. You have to be willing to stand your ground on this with all boundaries. But there's, there's a, a point where I got to where, okay, this person's not carrying their weight. And so I, I wouldn't help the person out because they would just show up to work being a bum. They wouldn't know their job. They'd come in and ask stupid questions that they should have already known the answers to. You know, that if I have to show someone the same basic thing six times over, like, okay, here's to save this in a specific location on your computer, you gotta, gotta click on the file menu, save, and then pick the location. I've literally had instances where I've had to show people stuff like that half a dozen times. I don't respect people that are like that. If you are so lazy, if you are so mentally lazy, that you can't bother to learn the most basic shit that is part of your job. Okay, number one, I'm not gonna respect you, but number two, I worked at places where I, it seemed like maybe it was kind of like an expectation that you pick up the pieces for those people, but I got to a point where I just stopped caring completely. I went in, did my work, I did it well. <clears throat> Don't do sloppy work, don't do poor work. Do your job, do it right, do it well but I just didn't care about any of this extra stuff. Like in the case of someone not knowing their job, it's like, okay, well, I've shown this moron how to do something three or four times. They keep asking how to do it. It's something that's extremely simple. Like it wouldn't be a complicated process, be something very simple. It's like, I'm not gonna show a person how to do something six, seven times that's simple. Okay, if you can't learn after the first two, three times of something that's really easy to do, I'm just not gonna care. You can flounder, you can foobar your work, I'm not gonna help you out. That, so it's instances like that. And I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I get my fucking work done and that's that. So this is, this is a very, very fine line to walk. And like I said, if you've never done this before, it's gonna take some practice. Start very small. 
because this could get you fired if you do it the wrong way. It seems to me that a lot of employers, again, maybe I was just misreading people that I've worked for in the past, that I have actually had more respect from employers when I have got to this point, like where, okay, I don't care if this person's being a moron, I'm not gonna show them how to fix their screw ups. Again, this is, this is a very fine line and it's hard for me to properly explain this one. This is something that as you go on, if you start practicing this, you, you do like really small doses, you'll kind of start picking up what it is that I'm getting at with that one. Anyway, we are over an hour and a half. My voice is starting to go out and I've got to go edit all this stuff. And so that's going to take up quite a bit of time. So anyway, if you like the video, drop a like, let me know, leave a comment. I'm going to be making plenty more videos like this in the future. There was a lot of content that I dropped in this one. So I'm probably going to clip, chop this one up if you made it that far. If you see these videos chopped up, uh, on the channel over the coming weeks or coming months or whatever. Just know it's the same content. When I do like an hour and a half long video, usually what I do is chop it up anyway and, and do smaller clips. And that way I can do a title and thumbnail that's gonna pull in an audience that I didn't already have for this main video. So if you like it, drop a comment. Let me know what else you'd like to see. There is, wow, that was, that was a lot. That was a lot of stuff to talk about. So with all that being said, if you hate it, if you're an employer, you got butt hurt over anything that I'm saying, I don't give a shit. Go shit up the comments. I'll call you out. I'll give you a pin of shame. Drop a dislike, whatever. I really don't care. This is my channel. I'm going to do what I want. With all that being said, I'll see you in the next one.